Awesome. Well, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I am recording, just so you all know, but it's tracking me up here, so it shouldn't get any of you all back there. But uh, so I'm Mr. Cochran. I teach uh, cybersecurity at the Delaware Area Career Center. So we are a career tech school. We have, I think, 26 plus different uh, career pathways for students. Um, my pathway that I teach is cybersecurity. And uh, this is a little bit about myself. I'm a geek, uh, born and raised in Delaware County. I actually graduated from one of our feeder schools, Buckeye Valley. Um, and then I actually was a product of a career center. I went to Tri Rivers up in Marion, Ohio. So kind of cool full circle. I'm actually teaching a program very similar to one that I actually went through as a student. So um, started out my career straight out of high school, went into the financial industry working with ATM machines. And then from there, um, moved over into a company doing courtroom audio video. Uh, and then about five years ago now, I actually joined the Career Center, but joined in their IT department. So started out as a tech there. Um, and then they were, the networking instructor was retiring. And with the retirement of that networking instructor, uh, the school was changing it to a cybersecurity program. So it was like, well, I'd done software training in the past, adult trainings, that kind of stuff. Um, and was like, I never thought about high school teaching, but hey, I'll throw my hat in the ring, see what happens. The rest is history. So I'm just now into my fourth year uh, teaching there at the Career Center. Um, going along with my geekness, uh, I also am a ham radio operator, KD8RBH. Any other hams in the room? Man, I was hoping to find at least one. Um, I am an Eagle Scout, uh, director of uh, contest judging at the National Robotics Challenge, and then serve as a technical volunteer for our Delaware County Homeland Security and Office of Emergency Management. So a little bit more about myself, I, like I mentioned earlier, Tri Rivers, uh, and then the National Robotics Challenge is a STEM program up in Marion. Um, we do all kinds of robotics and that kind of stuff. Um, as we go through this, if you want to know a little bit more about myself, Certification Magazine actually did an article about myself in the Cybersecurity Lab. Uh, and then a few months later, they actually did uh, an article on one of my students. Uh, she is actually now out at Purdue University studying cybersecurity, um, but she actually finished up her high school school year with her parents being in Texas. Um, so she finished up high school all alone. So uh, a couple things. I'm going to need um, a volunteer here in a second. So one of you are going to have to nominate yourself. But um, this is an icebreaker game I play with my students. Normally I pass these out. So if you want, mentally, just go ahead and start to fill this out in your head. And then we'll talk about it here in a minute. But um, I need that volunteer. So um, before they come on, or come on up, I need somebody. I don't care, whoever. Somebody. Come on. Don't make me be a like, high school student and be, ah, oh, there we go. You got it. OK, but for everybody else, what are these? What are these guys? Flash drives. flash drives, right? Well, that's what you would think. So this one is a flash drive, and you can see it's actually branded DACC. It's my school branding. This is a true flash drive. This is what is called a USB rubber ducky. So a USB rubber ducky is a keyboard injection tool. So it is a tool that basically inside here, this is a keyboard is what the computer thinks this is. And when you plug it in, it will very quickly type uh, programming code, um, and it's as fast as you can type. I see my camera I've decided to get you all, but um, so it will type as quickly as the computer can possibly type. So what I have, though, we've all heard, don't plug in thumb drives into our computers, and that's the reason why. What are these? Uh, that looks like a USB C cable. Yeah. And looks so like one of those is malicious, and one is not. So you tell me. <laughs> which one is malicious and which one is safe? Let's plug it in to find out. <laughs> uh, I don't believe there's any way I'm going to be able to decipher. So just pick one then. That one's safe? Uh, no, this one's bad. That one's bad? Yep. Okay, let me have this one. You can hold on to that one. This one's bad. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and plug this into my phone. So I'll go ahead and take that back from you. What you're going to see is my phone's going to turn off here in a second. Thank you for being a good sport. There you oh, go. Thank you. So my phone just turned off. Hold on. Don't go anywhere. But here in a second, my phone's going to turn back on. So you see my phone turn on. It's going to punch in my pin code. It's going to then open up a web browser. It's going to open up a new web page. And if, as long as I have self service, it's actually going to load up a website here. So there's the website. So do you have your phone on you? No, uh, back here. No. Okay, go grab it real quick. All right. So with that, uh, who else has their phone on them? I know this is normally not a normal teacher thing to do, but go ahead and get your phones out. Open up your available Wi-Fi. Let me see your phone. Let me go and see your phone. 
You were actually gonna hand me your phone? You're standing right next to me. Oh, you were gonna hand me your phone. Yeah, so so right open up your available Wi-Fi. Yep. So you should see an OMG. Do you see OMG? I do. Okay, don't connect to that. Um, so what that is, the OMG, you're good. You can go ahead and have a seat. Thank you for playing along. You've been a good sport. So, this is my computer? Yeah, you can. It's, yeah. it's a webcam privacy cover. Right. So what this is, is you saw that Wi-Fi access point. There's actually a Wi-Fi access point coming out of this cable. So the electronics inside here turned on, and what that could let you do is you could actually remotely inject code into my computer. How many of you have a USB-C keyboard plugged into your computer? If you have that, this is also a key logger. So this will also pass and capture anything that you're typing in on that computer. This technology exists. As you saw, you picked the wrong cable. Um, but this is things that we think about implant devices and technology, we gotta worry about our supply chain. And this is what we've gotta get students talking about and thinking about and getting that on their forefront. Um, I really liked in the last talk they were talking about, um, you know, maybe we don't have students that, maybe not all my students go into cybersecurity, but at least they know about these that exist and they're starting to think about that and they're a good cyber citizen and have good cyber hygiene. So this is the OMG cable and all of you iPhone users think, oh, I'm okay, I'm safe. Uh, wrong, they make an iPhone cable too. <laughs> so you're uh, just as bad there. So all of you kind of mentally filled this game out. Anybody notice anything with it? It's actually a social engineering exercise. So you would be surprised how many students I get. Now it's not fair that I'm a teacher, right? And I get like this, there's an inherent level of trust that I, I exploit that a little bit and that's, that's what it is. But we think about like this data that we're filling out. Um, we look at like I'm getting their name, right? I'm getting an email address. A lot of these are, what are those? Security questions, password reset questions, exactly. We think about schools, right? I ask them for their associate school, their home school. We think about how geographical school districts work. That roughly gives me a geographical location of where they live. Uh, and then their graduating year. Well, I can do some math and I can figure out approximately how old they are. So just by a simple little icebreaker game, they're actually giving a lot of PII or personal identifiable information. So I teach at the Delaware Area Career Center. That's in Delaware, Ohio. We have an amazing, beautiful building. Uh, this is a high school student, or a high school school. We teach um, juniors and seniors. We're located just north of Columbus, Ohio in Delaware, right there on 23. So when I get my students, my students come in, they have no background. They have no prerequisites to come into my program. So I get a wide gamut of students. I get some that are very hyper-technical and some that are not. So when we talk about what is cybersecurity, I really like this. It's cybersecurity is the practice of defending computers, mobile devices, servers, and electronic data systems and networks. And ultimately we're protecting the data from malicious attack. And if you notice data is bolded. So that data is what we are protecting as cybersecurity analysts and cybersecurity professionals. Whether that data is on a device, in hardware, or on a network, or even in transit. Ultimately our job is to protect that data. So this is my cybersecurity lab. This was when it was new and beautiful and clean. Um, at the nature of our business, we do computers and that kind of stuff. My students start out with basic hardware and software. Uh, it gets a little messy, but that's our uh, cybersecurity lab there. These are some cool and amazing projects that my students have done. Uh, for the Delaware County Emergency Management Agency, we actually did some revamping of their AV equipment. So I actually went through and uh, students spec'd it all out. Um, this was during COVID, so it was actually even a hybrid, so they were learning how to work in remote teams um, and being able to code that up. And they came up with some really cool coding things. Um, we've got some other cool things. This one I really like. Um, all of our students wear an ID badge, and it has a barcode on that ID badge. And that's what they are supposed to wear every day, but the school really doesn't use it for anything. Well, one of my students coded up a program on a Raspberry Pi and a touchscreen with a barcode scanner, and that's what we use for the bathroom, check in and check out. So that actually when they scan it, puts their name and a date timestamp, um, and then they, they, a student actually coded that. One of my other students saw that the year after and was like, that's really cool. Uh, I'm gonna go one step further, and they made me an attendance system. So up at my desk, when all my students come in in the morning, they scan in, and it removes their name from a list, and when I scan my badge, it shows me the names of students that are absent that day, so I can quickly get attendance. Some of the cool stuff that we have in our lab is we have uh, some server and networking racks. I was very fortunate when the school um, put in the networking lab that ultimately became our cybersecurity lab. Um, they actually put in a separate network in that lab. So I have a completely air-gapped network um, on my system and that's our networking rack. This is all student driven. So we actually have 10 gigabit fiber in there. We have a server rack in the other room. 
Um, and then we run um, Proxmox, so we can actually do um, our own kind of cyber range in-house um, in our air gap network. But again, 10 gigabit fiber, we have a Raspberry Pi cluster. Um, we've got some servers up here. We've got a smart mirror. Um, and then our whole network stack. And again, this is all student driven. So students are getting hands on with fiber, with networking, IP addresses, dealing with that infrastructure. We also added a door access control system. So that actually is how you get into the secured server room. Only a certain amount of students are authorized per week to get into the server room and then that's all data logged. So this is a promo video. Um, I don't know if we're gonna have a lot of time, but I do wanna play this at least. It's only about one minute long. Um, this is one of the programs, hopefully my We focus on two major uh, certifications in the IT industry. One's our A plus and our security plus. With those industry certifications, they can take those straight into the workforce. A lot of companies, that's like what they need to have their entry level hiring. Or they can take those and roll those over into a two year or a four year program. Uh, a lot of colleges and universities will actually give them college credits or let them test out of classes based on those industry certifications. By coming into the lab, you get to get that real world experience, you get to talk to industry partners and then kind of find out if this is something that you're passionate about. To succeed at DACC in the cybersecurity program, it doesn't mean you have to have a lot of experience in cybersecurity, you just have to be willing to learn and explore uh, and if you have that curiosity, you'll have a lot of fun here in this lab. This is a real quick little intro video of our lab, let's keep moving on. So rules, when we talk about cybersecurity in high school setting, everybody instantly goes, oh. Uh, are we really gonna let students do this? And it's like, well, yeah, but we have to have a framework. We have to have a framework of how we're gonna allow them it. I, I, my wife, I have to give her a lot of credit for the, a lot of this stuff is, um, we help students and I f help them flex their digital muscle, right? We're giving them an opportunity to learn in a safe and an, an ethical environment, but they're still getting to play with really cool tools and things. So we have policies. Well, what's cool about these policies, these are actually student written policies. Uh, last year, one of my students was like, hey, Mr. Cochran, I would actually really enjoy doing that. I, I just kind of have a passion about policy. Um, and this is something that they're gonna do when they get out of the workforce. They're gonna be creating this stuff. Um, so he actually wrote up policies on our system configurations, our server configurations, and our mobile devices. Actually, take that back. This one's Mr. Cochran. This is cell phones. Cell phones are my worst enemy in class, uh, distracting from students. Um, so we have a whole cell phone policy. Then we get into the fun cybersecurity rules, right? We have do's and don'ts. No USB thumb drives. I don't want any malware into my network, so you don't bring any USBs. Um, no key loggers and that kind of stuff. Um, but we, this is kind of like my catch-all line. Um, you know, if you're ever doing a security audit for a company, there's always somebody at that company that knows that you're doing that security audit. Whether that's the CTO or CEO, there's always somebody that knows about it. And I'm that person for the cybersecurity lab. We have that conversation prior to things happening in the lab. But I'm all bored, let's have some fun. As long as we're not like destroying physical hardware because I don't have an infinite budget. Um, as long as the software stuff, let's have fun, let's play with it. We also came up with a software authorization form. So we think about software that needs to get installed on our computers that might be outside of our curriculum but we still wanna play around with it. So we just came up with a little simple form that we vetted the software, it looks good, um, and Mr. Cochran or the IT department will be the ones that download that, not the students. So the reason I'm here, my students, right? So at DACC, we start them pretty young. Okay, I'm kidding. This is my son, it's kinda hard to see. Um, he's like two in that picture. This is about the only picture you'll find of him ever online. Um, we don't show his face, that's just a personal thing. Um, we've kinda done that, but I thought this was kinda funny. He sat at one of the computers one day in my classroom. He loves going into daddy's classroom. Um, but these are my actual students. So uh, like I said, I'm just now into my fourth year, so I've had three graduating cohorts and you're like, well, I see two. Well, 2020 happened. We had COVID, they didn't have a graduation. So sadly, I didn't get a picture with my first ever graduating class. Um, but this is my students. Um, anybody see any problems with that picture? Anybody? Yay, there we go. So no female representation, right? There's only, I've got literally three here and two up there. That's a problem. But when we look at it from an industry standpoint in the cybersecurity, there's only 24% representation by female. So we need to fix that. Now I'm sitting in my lab at like 10%. That's a problem. That is a major problem. We need to start having those conversations earlier and earlier with young women about, hey, you can do cyber, you can do IT stuff. Sorry guys, it's nothing special. Um, but we can get more females in. So my school did a really cool thing with girls in tech. 
Uh, so these were a couple, these actually two girls graduated last year. Uh, these two down here are my current seniors. Um, but this was out at BPA, they actually won some awards. Uh, this one went on to uh, National BPA for Website Design and Security Design. Um, but they did a really cool thing highlighting the girls in my classroom. So more pictures of my students. Our BPA, we got quite a bit of trophies you see. Uh, this student went on to Nationals uh, and ended up coming in second place in Linux operating systems at Nationals. Um, so it was a runner up. We had three uh, first places in the state of Ohio, one in Linux, uh, computer security and then website design. And then we had a couple other Linux and a Python follow up winners. Uh, this is that website design team. This was actually a cross collab lab. So it was not only my cybersecurity lab student, but we also had an app dev student and a couple digital design students. So I really like this. I focus, I, like I mentioned earlier, the CompTIA A plus and security plus certifications. Um, this sits up in the back of our classroom. I get their hacker name. So it's not like any, they, it's up to them if they disclose who they are. Um, but this is like the certification board. So you can see it's pretty bare. But then we get things like this where those certifications start to come in really popular. And then I have my overachiever students that really love to have, oh, I get to add a piece of paper because I ran out of space. And they just keep it going. Um, so it's kind of funny. And then they hang up their certifications. But then you'll get students that'll do some open source intelligence because we hang up the certs with their actual names on it. And they'll say, okay, well, this person got that cert and that cert. They're the only ones with those two certifications. So that's them. <laughs> you know, and they figure out whose hacker name is who. So. Um, but this is a really cool visual representation. So with certifications in our fourth year, uh, we've actually have a whopping 388 certificates and certifications coming out of this program. So we are on track for about a little over 100 certifications and certificates per year. Um, and these are some big ones. So we do that CompTIA A plus and Security Plus, uh, but then we also do some other ones, some PC Pro. We also do OSHA 10 because students are climbing on ladders with wire networking and that kind of stuff. And then we get into some Linux ones and there's a bunch of like optional extras with like the Microsoft certifications. So I'm really curious, uh, anyone in here have their A plus and security plus? You have both? Yep. Come on up. <laughs> Come on up, you're the first person to raise your hand. So I gotta get your name afterwards, hopefully you're okay with it. I actually have a cybersecurity challenge coin for you. So this is custom made for our cybersecurity lab. If you notice it's got the Delaware County logo in the background. Um, my wife, again, giving her credit, she came up with the design. Uh, one of our digital design programs uh, students actually digitized it and we had. So my rule is to get this, to earn this, you have to get both your A plus and your security plus certifications. So congratulations, oh, you get both. There you go. Yeah. I, I would like to get your name because it's actually serialized. There's only 100 of those and I'm trying to keep track of where they all go. So there's some all cool little like hidden secrets behind there, uh, white hat, black hat. You have to see what you can solve and then let me know. So uh, looking at the time, I think we're doing pretty good. Um, talking about motivation for students. How do we motivate people, right? Like what's the best way to motivate people? So we think about intrinsic and extrinsic motivations. So what's an extrinsic motivator? So if you at your job, what's an extrinsic motivator for you? Money. Money, coin, coin. <laughs> yeah, coin, <laughs> money, right? Well, we think about from the student standpoint what that might be. Great. Grades, right? That's an extrinsic motivator. But we want to look more intrinsic. We want them to be passionate about it. We want them to have enjoyment, curiosity out of this. That's the thing, that, that's kind of my like number one job. Yeah, I have all my ODE requirements and everything else that I have to do. But my ultimate goal is to, get that curiosity going, right? Like get them excited about what's going on because what I'm teaching them technically wise is gonna be obsolete tomorrow, really. I mean, technology is changing so rapidly. My job is to teach them A, how to learn, but to get them excited about learning. So some of the cool things that we do, we play around with Raspberry Pis, um, we do Ponagachis, Hash Monsters, um, some other different things. Hackertest.net is a really cool website. Um, there's like 20 different levels. It's not really hacking. Um, you're just more or less inspecting the elements and going through the code of the website, but some cool things to do. And it's free and it's online. And I always tell parents it's okay, it's legal and it's safe. <laughs> but the big one, the big motivation is, and the way I do it is I gamify their learning. So gamification of learning. And I do that through capture the flag, CTFs. There's a whole bunch of CTFs, but this is actually one that I do in my classroom. Uh, this is one that I developed and put together. Um, and if you notice here, there's forensic images. Well, one of our digital design students actually was doing for forensic photography 
uh, for their capstone project. And I said, hey, could I give you like some cybersecurity related things? Like I got a Wi-Fi pineapple in there, some USB rubber duckies. And I was like, could I give you some of this and you could put it into your photos? It'd be kind of neat. She's like, yeah, cool, okay. So they did that, so then I used that as a part of my storyline for my capture the flag. And then I got like did evidence bags, so each group gets evidence and they've got a forensic image of what was on those thumb drives that they have to then dive into and that gives them clues to solve problems and to work through it. Think of uh, how many of you have ever been to like a game room um, where you have like an escape room where you have to escape out of the room and you gotta solve puzzles to get out of there. Think of it like that, but it's about a three hour CTF um, and then they have to break into the closet and then when they get into the closet they can get their access codes. So that's one way I gamify learning. Um, I don't have audio, sadly. This was a, a video I did of me talking about that capture the flag. Hey, Mr. Coggin here in the cybersecurity lab. Hey, wanted to come on and make a quick uh, video to talk about, so my seniors, uh, my juniors will be getting ready to do it here in about a week or two, but uh, today we're doing a capture the flag here in lab. So just working on getting all the clues put together uh, all the hints and stuff. So we got some pretty cool stuff happening. So they've got little puzzles they've got to solve inside some evidence bags and uh, some classified top secret information. And all those are inside these puzzles. So super cool stuff here happening at the cybersecurity lab. But again, about capture the flags. So one of the big ones, so I put this survey out to all my students too. You'll see, I'll talk about all the different capture the flags that we do. Um, but this year, so I have currently uh, 25 juniors and I have uh, 20 seniors. So I have 45 students this year. 30 of those students signed up for some kind of a capture the flag. So they were interested in doing a capture the flag. Um, 21 of them signed up for a MITRE capture the flag and we'll talk about what MITRE is. Uh, they do their embedded hardware. Um, but it is a collegiate capture the flag. It is a college only capture the flag where you're like, Mr. Cochran, you teach high school. Yes, I know that. Um, but we are actually the only high school team that has competed into this event. Um, the first year we, uh, out of like 20 colleges, my students came in 10th place as a high school level in colleges, beating out like MIT, uh, Texas A&M. There's a bunch of big name schools that we're talking about here. Um, the next year we came in third place out of about 25 colleges. And then just last year, how MITRE works is they have an attack phase and a design phase. You have to pass the design phase before you can get into the attack phase. Um, only nine schools made it into the attack phase. We were one of those nine as a high school student. Ultimately, my students came in eighth place out of 32 colleges and universities. So high school students can do complex hardware embedded technologies. It just takes a passion about that to do it. Um, so you can see we got an honorable mention for uh, dedication and perseverance because we made it in at ninth place, but we made it in five minutes to spare. They were, but they, hey, they made it in and they were going for it. Um, this is one of my students at Purdue University. Um, she was really big into the capture the flags and stuff. So I said, hey, would you come in and talk to my students when she was a senior? I said, come in and talk to the juniors, get them excited about it. So she actually put this slide deck together and came in and I try to empower my students to do this kind of stuff. Um, so she actually came in and did a presentation all about the different capture the flags. So Pico CTF, um, Seesaw, Cyberstart, National Cyber League is a big one. Cyber Patriot put on by the Air Force. And I know I'm going through these pretty quickly. See me after and I can give you direct names and stuff if you need. Um, Cyber Patriot, this is put on by the United States Air Force. This is a big one. It actually starts uh, next week for us. It's this week and next week. And then the MITRE ECTF, that collegiate capture the flag event. So with that, I also asked the uh, programming team lead uh, last year. Um, they both came in and gave a presentation specifically about um, the MITRE capture the flag, trying to recruit, right? Because that's one thing I really do is I try to have both juniors and seniors. So there's that knowledge passing. So I have uh, different team leads and that kind of stuff. Um, so they talk about like what they do and go through that kind of stuff. This was more for students, but I wanted to show, this is a PowerPoint that they put together and they created to show it off. They even came up with some prereqs. So they actually had to go through and fill out um, if you wanted to be a part of the team, you had to go and fill out this information. And it just involved kind of some open source intelligence. There was really no right or wrong answers. It was more, are you putting the time into it? Are you really curious? Are you really passionate about it? Um, one of my favorites was, and I actually went out to MITRE and gave a talk out there with them about this. And uh, one of them in here was, uh, there's a typo actually on their website. 
And they were like, wait, where's the typo? And I was like, I'm not telling you, because then you'll go fix it, and then my form doesn't work. Um, but the goal was to get students to really read through things and to look through things. Again, um, we have our, um, every year with the MITRE capture the flag, they have to do a, a presentation that they get to present to the other schools. So these are our presentations. They're on a private playlist. Um, I talked about that third, pl uh, tenth place. This was literally the team for that first year. There was actually three students. Uh, the one chose to not be in a picture. Um, but there was actually three students that first year and they came in tenth place. This year we had about four students that year and they came in third place. And you can see there's some big name schools that they beat out. So um, they're right there at the ACC and you can see some of the bigger name schools. And then this was last year, there's the schools and then there we are right there in eighth place. And I did have to, I, 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 sorry, I have to throw this into your face again. Um, but uh, we beat out Michigan State University. So my senior that graduated and started a team up at Michigan State, we beat him, right? So that was one thing we had to do. Next year, this year, um, my student, she's actually went out to Purdue University and I, I keep on her about starting a, a, a minor team there. So now we have to beat Michigan State and Purdue. Um, and we might have another couple students at the Ohio State one. So this was a, a, the MITRE team meeting out in the hallway. Um, I also, when I posted this online, I actually, if you notice here, I blocked out the TV um, so other teams couldn't get like private information and get a leg up on them. So making sure that you're paying attention to those background data that you're putting out there um, so other teams can't use open source intelligence. This is how the students manage. Um, how are we on time? Okay. So this is how students manage. They use a Trello, and I had to zoom way out on that Trello board, um, but this is how they keep track of all the different tasks and challenges that they have to do, and they assign roles and that kind of stuff. And when we look at the different roles that we have, um, these are some of those challenge or those uh, Trello boards, different things that they have to do, and they, we also put some student resources, like, hey, if you wanna go learn Python, here's where you can go learn Python. If you wanna learn C++, here's where you can go to learn that. So empowering students to take on their own learning. Um, and it's also funny, it was a cool side effect of doing this kind of stuff. Um, I had students, they were doing their lab work at home, their coursework at home. So when they were in lab, they could do this kind of stuff. It was kind of like flipping the classroom on me. That was not something I was actually expecting, but they wanted to get their boring stuff out of the way at home. So when they're in class, they could do the fun stuff with their peers um, and, and focus on that. So these are just some of those challenges and different things. We had one student that he, he took on the management of the Trello board and the Slack board, and then he found like an API to merge the two. So when you had something due in Trello, it would also alert everybody in Slack. Um, so some cool things like that. So we talked about the different roles, and this is where I try to really empower my students to take on that, that leadership role. So not only am I developing their cybersecurity skills, but I'm also working on those soft skills. Because when we think about employers, that's one of the important things. The technicals, we can teach those. You know, if we think about like proprietary software, proprietary hardware, nobody's gonna know that coming into your organization. So we have to teach them how to A, learn, but then also how to interact as peers, how to interact um, in a team environment and work collaboratively. So we have a, pro a senior team lead, and then below that we have a junior team lead. Normally that junior team lead will then become the senior team lead the following year. Um, and then we start to look through from there, we have our lead developer, and then we have our under developers, like our junior developers, they're the ones helping that lead developer. And then we have our pro uh, Trello manager, which actually this year is probably gonna change to more of a project manager role, because that's kind of what that morphed into. This was the first year we really made defined roles. Um, so this will be our second year doing it. So that'll probably change to more of a project management role. We have crypto people, people that are into cryptography. We have a scribe, so um, I didn't bring it, but we have an engineering notebook that belongs in the lab that students have to make notes in, um, and it's a part of the team, and it really helps them when they go to make their presentation. They can resort back to, oh, day one, we did this. Oh, that's right. Um, it just helps them document. I know I'm really bad about that, um, and we're really bad about that a lot of times in industries, but we need to document what we're learning, not maybe for uh, other people, but even for ourselves. And then we have a photographer. I took on this role just trying to get pictures, trying to document things. Um, and then we have a video producing team. This one's always interesting um, because at the end of the year where they make that presentation and they have to record like a five to 10 minute video. Um, and every year so far we've done this, I get random students that didn't want to be a part of the CTF, but they're like, I like audio, I like video, can I help with that? Um, and it's like, yeah, absolutely. So they even help create the video stuff. So we're coming up to the end here. 
Um, and then I'll kind of open it up to questions and stuff. But just talking about some of the strengths and challenges of the program. I think the strengths of our program is our students. Um, I've kind of talked about a little bit about what they've done, but just really their passion and their dedication to the field and to what they're learning. Um, ultimately, that's the strength of the program. Um, and then acts, having access to stuff um, helps well, for sure, but there's ways, there's free online resources. People can go to the libraries and get access to computers nowadays. Um, but the, really the strength is our students. Some of the challenges in the program, um, definitely like work-based learning stuff. That's been one of my biggest hurdles. Um, Ohio Department of Education is really pushing work-based learning hours on uh, high school students. Um, and that's really challenging, especially when it comes to cybersecurity. When we look at that, because a lot of companies and organizations, um, they not only have data policies and procedures, but they're like, high school student? Nope, sorry. We only do this for, high, for colleges. And it's like, I'm sorry, but my high school students can do this. And I, I respect the, you know, below 18 years old. I get that, you know, a minor to an adult thing. But when we're talking about an adult high school student, um, you know, that's one area of, of strength that I have a hard time with. So if any of you are in industry or even not in industry and in education um, and would love to talk to me, I, please, I've got um, some work-based learning uh, pamphlets of things that we're looking for for the Career Center. Um, not necessarily in just the cybersecurity program, but abroad. Um, but especially that's one of the biggest challenges I have in my program. Um, and that just comes with time, right? I'm only in my fourth year teaching. I'm a geek. I come from the technology background. So just figuring out the education side and making those industry connections, doing things like this helps build that. Um, but that's one of the biggest challenges I have. So um, with that, if you would like to get in touch with me or make contact, probably the easiest way to find me for everything is elicochran.me. Um, that's kind of like my portfolio page. Um, it has links to my social media stuff. It's got links to my school site. Um, basically my contact stuff, that's probably the best way to find me at personal or work-wise. Um, you can go from there. It's got my LinkedIn, my Facebook, sadly, uh, my Twitter. Um, I have Facebook because of work, sorry. Um, but anyways, I'll leave you with this. Our Facebook group uh, for our cybersecurity lab and then our LinkedIn, uh, my LinkedIn there, and then my contact, uh, my personal in school. But thank you all for your time. At this point, I'd love to open it up to questions um, and see what you all have. I'd like to hear where you guys are from and go from there. How are we? Okay, sweet. Sweet. Questions. We'll start there. Yes? I want to go first because I have like a lot. Okay, hit me. Okay, so I'm from Spring Hill Park CTC. Okay, yeah. Um, and I teach cybersecurity programming. Awesome, sweet. I'm, I'm going to get third, my water while you're talking. Sure thing. I'm in my third year. So awesome, you. okay, yeah. So, some questions I have. Um, you said that they built a lab with an air-gapped network. Yes. Do you manage it? I do, while well, students do. Okay, so your IT is not involved with managing that network. I mean, we have to have that relationship with IT, right? But, but no, they do not manage it. My students directly manage that network. How did you convince them to allow you to have it? <laughs> uh, it was actually in place already. So you didn't so, have to make that argument. So I didn't have to make that argument, but I will help you make that argument. It is vital. Yes. It's absolutely vital. Um, and the, the way to sell that, and I'll help you with selling it, is it's air-gapped. So there's no outside connection point to it. It's completely air-gapped. And then also, so, and I can go back to another slide, um, but what we have too is at the desks, um, talk to me after and I'll show you the picture, but at the, at the desks, students have a little junction box that they actually switch, hardwire switch from production network to off production network. So it's a physical movement of an RJ45 uh, network connection and that's how they can get over to that. So there's no accidental. Any other questions? I know you got some more. I'll come back to you. I want to see. To yeah, I'll come back to you. Anybody else? All right, well, we're back to you. Okay, yeah, go ahead. So you, you mentioned the, the work-based? Yes, work-based learning, yeah. Are there any industry partnerships that you're either exploring or you've already stood up? Uh, Not yet. I would love to talk to you if you have some. On the industry? Yeah, yeah. We're very interested yeah, please. in what we can probably do. That would be awesome. That would be amazing. Yeah, that, it, it, that's just part of that conversation. Um, we've got a couple that are in works, but nothing that's like firm and solid. Um, even just job shadowing stuff, right? Like um, that kind of thing even falls under that work-based learning. So yeah, let's definitely get my contact info and let's connect for sure. I would love that. I'll come back to you. Okay, so um, I'll just uh, second that yeah. I cannot find yeah. that will my kids. It's, it's impossible. It's, and it, it it's stinks. It's not impossible. We, can't, we haven't figured it out. Yeah, it, and ODE makes, so you guys know, ODE is pushing 250 hours per student. 
And I, that's, I'm sorry, that's impossible for so, me. So those CCFs so, will count for that though? They will, so, yes. That's what, um, that's what we're starting to look at as a research kind of simulated work so environment. Simulation yep. work environments, yeah. So that's how I'm trying to get my hours. Yep, so same. Yet. Yeah, same. Um, but um, you said you built, build computers. Yes. So they build computers. Yes. Do you buy new kits every year or do you take apart an old computer? How, yeah. how do you do that? So this was my first year for actually building a new system. Um, and I bought just some new hardware. Uh, it was like a Ryzen 9 build. Um, it also helped that uh, it was with a grant for our eSports League that just started. So trying to figure out those cross collab lab and things that you can do um, because that's gonna help with funding, right? It's multi-purpose. Not only are you helping out your program, but you're helping out other things. Um, but a lot of our stuff, actually just working with your IT department um, and say, hey, when this goes for recycling after five years, let me have it. Um, and that's how I got a lot of my old computer systems was they were the previous networking's computers. And then last year I just got another like 15 or 20 computers um, because they were engineering's computers that they were recy gonna recycle. Um, and then talking to industry partners, that's how actually we got our servers. Um, IGS Energy actually donated uh, the servers and they were about six years old. Um, so if you ever have a company that's willing to donate some hardware, um, take them up on it, definitely. Um, and I'm always open to hardware, you know, definitely talk to me. Even if you, even if I don't take the hardware, I might know some other people that would love to have that hardware. Um, I saw a hand up back here and then I'll come back to you because I know you got a bunch. Yeah, I missed the beginning, sorry. Yeah, you're good. Um, is this a two year program? It is a two year, yep, yep. So it's two years, it's juniors and seniors. Um, and currently I have 25 juniors and 20 seniors. Um, and we focus on A plus, CompTIA A plus for the juniors and CompTIA Security Plus for my seniors. Mixed in some ethical hacking, networking, that kind of stuff. And so how do kids get into, like are they at the Career Center, like that's their place? Yeah, so they pull, we pull from the surrounding schools in our district from Delaware County. Um, but it's a, it's a random lottery. Um, is how it's, it's fair and equitable is it's just pulled by, you've got to meet like the certain um, entry deadline. I'll come back to you. Okay. And, but actually to answer your question about the networking stuff, so on the wall when they wired the room, they wired our production system and then they also wired an off production network. Okay. Um, and then just uh, two, uh, last year, we built these boxes. So these are just a Keystone Junction box and then what we did was we brought the blue one up from the computer and then I got these little like RJ45 locks that prevent the connector from coming out. And then we have a little tiny six inch adapter and that jumps over to the production network. When they want to go to off production, we just disconnect here, plug it over into the off production and then that gives you that off production connection. And then we added um, a headphone jack to the computer for audio and then also an HDMI up to our monitor so when we do the Raspberry Pi projects, we're not having to climb behind the monitor. And then if a student breaks this HDMI connection, it breaks the little $2 RJ45, not my $200 monitor. Okay, I love this. Okay, because- Take a picture of it. That was, that was my next question. <laughs> that was my next question was uh, on that topic because how do you make sure they're not plugging in the wrong thing? Yep, that's how you do it. Um, locking it, locking that, and there's a little key that you can technically pull it out. My IT wants me to tell them how they're going to let me do it. Mine's the same. Um, okay. Mine's the same. <laughs> you just got to build that relationship. It helped also that I came over from the IT department, but day one teaching, all my special permissions went away. Yeah, right, okay, yeah. I'm just no, a teacher now. I have now. no admin rights. Is that true for you? Yes, and actually I prefer that. So okay. my school did set up, we try to use everything virtual machines. Proxmox is a really good tool. Um, it's, a, it's a hosting environment that's free. Um, think of it like VMware, but for free. Um, and that's what we run on our servers, the donated servers. But we use like Oracle VirtualBox and they can have full admin rights in those, but the computers are actually locked down. Have your IT department look at LAPS, L-A-P-S, LAPS. It's, I'm pretty sure it's a Microsoft product. My IT department had it set up. Basically, there's a local administrator account on that computer, and there is a password that changes um, every like 10 days. And then this program, as long as you have permission to access it, then gives you access to the local administrator account. So it's nice when you have to install software because I don't want to type in my credentials on the student computer um, just in case the student put a key logger on there. Um, you know, I don't want them to get my network credentials and now they're Mr. Cochran on the network. Um, I use that LAPS program and then it's a local administrator. But yeah, I, I actually prefer it to be locked down. So then 
on this WBL um, yeah. topic, mm -hmm. you did a project with your local EMA. Yeah, EMA, yeah. Um, uh, so with that um, connection, it wasn't really like an internship for the students. Right. But how did you make that connection? I didn't. Um, oh. I, it was, this was my first year teaching. <laughs> um, I also had a newborn that was in the NICU at the same time too. So like Mr. Cochran was just getting by, but my students were still able to have the opportunity. So sadly, all of those hours did not get tied to work-based learning. Um, but, but how did moving, you make the connection with them? Oh, I, I was a technical volunteer from my ham radio days, um, and I'm still a technical volunteer with them. So that was just a, a natural um, connection there from that. But um, I would just recommend reaching out to your local EMA, your local emergency management agency, and, and trying to, to build that relationship. But um, that was a, a past connection, basically. I think we're good, right? Cut on time? Okay, questions, yeah, hit me. That's what I'm here for, you're here to learn. Yeah, so anything about trying to get more females? Yeah, yeah, that's a big one. And starting earlier. Yes. What would be your recommendation? Yeah, definitely for females, you know, starting middle school, right? Before they're even starting their college pathway or high school pathways and figuring out what they're gonna do in high school, having those conversations then um, I think is only gonna help. Um, because a lot of times, you know, like if we look at the career center, like we look at, um, what our school did was girls in tech, but they also did boys in nursing, right? And that kind of stuff. We look at like gender norms in the different labs. So, um, you know, just having those conversations earlier on, saying, hey girls, you can, you can do this. It's not difficult. It's, and we need that other mind, we need that mindset to, to look at that kind of stuff. Um, it's all problem solving. Need to start, um, by like sixth grade. Yes, I would say fifth, sixth grade. Yes, exactly. Yes, absolutely. 100%. Like right now I'm sitting at like 10%, 11% representation. Even our industry is 24%. I mean it's still really low even in industry. And that's grown over just uh, from like 2013 I think it was even like 13%. Um, so yeah. So, so Eli, yeah. you talked about females in STEM industry. Yeah. What, what are some activating events or exposures I think CTFs are really, that's one thing that I really can't stress enough. Capture the flags, um, digital capture the flags, hacking challenges, um, just getting that problem solving skill set to come out. Um, get the kids that are curious gaming, right? Like that really helps. But the ones that are like, like strategy games, like chess and that kind of stuff, you know, look at students that are, have a passion about that because ultimately that's gonna work really well when it comes to um, your, your capture the flags. Yeah, I think the industry partnerships are good too. I mean, I know that for we, sure. we actually on Saturday helped the Girl Scouts deliver their cyber security badges, the 40 Girl Scouts. I mean, these are, yeah. These are fourth grade. Right, right. That's um, perfect. Yeah. So anything we can do from an industry perspective or find those industry partners that are willing to support your programs so they can be. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. AWS is doing a co sign Girls Day with different race raiders next week, Friday. <laughs> yeah, it's the industry that's going to drive the interest yeah. at the younger levels for high school. If you really want to do it, it's got to be the industry. Well, for, for Capture the Flags, um, CTFD is a really good tool that I use. We just started using it. Um, but the one that I mainly used for my other capture the flag, it's more, CTFD is more of like a Jeopardy style. You've got, they have a problem, they solve it, they put a key in, they get points. Um, the other one I found was on just GitHub, and then I gave it to one of my students and said, hey, figure this out. And they went through and figured out Visual Studio Code, and they got it up and running, and it's actually a King of the Hill style, um, where there's attacking and defending simultaneously. Um, and then what I did was in Proxmox, um, which is that uh, hosting environment. Um, it can even, so talking about your IT department, uh, Proxmox can even take your air gapped, air gapped again. Um, so uh, with Proxmox, you can actually, for your virtual machines, you can put no exit port. So they literally only have access to an internal VLAN or an internal network on the server itself, um, which then they can hack there and it doesn't have an out port. And students access those just by the web browser. 
Um, that's all they need on their actual computer. So we put on a Windows XP victim system um, and then I went into the registry and made some known vulnerabilities and put those into the system so then students could attack those and, and hack on those. So that was like our victim and then our judging computer was like just a Windows 10 box and the only rule with the CTF was you can't interfere with the communication between the judge and the victim. That was really the only set rule. Everything else was fair game. You could hack the other team. It didn't matter. Um, the other team would have to figure out how to defend against that. What was the name of that CTF? The one, I, I don't know. If you talk to me after, I can pull it up. It was on GitHub. On GitHub. Um, it was about eight, nine years old at this point. Um, but yeah, it was just a, a, some guy posted it up on GitHub and yeah. hey, it works. Hey, one last question. Yeah, hit me. And your CTF, so they done part of class or extracurricular? You have that. Uh, extracurricular. So but they stay after school? Uh, no, during lab. So, um, so no, I have my students. Lab, great. So I have my students for three hours a day. So I have them for a good little bit of time. Um, but yeah, it is done during lab. Um, and this is all extracurricular. I really, I try not to put a grade to it because I don't want to change that motivation, right? I don't want that to go from an intrinsic to a transit, uh, extrinsic motivation. Um, so I really try not to tie a grade to it, especially even the MITRE one. It's funny because the MITRE one, Students are earning college credit for this out in the, and here's my students doing it just because they're having fun with it. Like they're not earning any kind of credit for it and I really like that. So that's one thing that scares me about doing work-based learning hours with it is I don't want to change that motivation. I want them to do it because they're passionate about it. Um, but to say a grade, no, I don't do a grade. Um, the, the Certification Magazine article talked about 20% um, projects. So Google's most known for it, but 3M was actually the company that developed it. And the idea behind it was um, they would give their employees 20% of their time to work on a passion project. How many of you ever used a, pro a small product called Gmail? Yeah, um, Gmail was actually came out of a 20% project. Um, and that was where employees got together and made this product. So I can't allot 20%. I try to softly allot 5%, but again, I get students that go home and do their schoolwork, so when they're in lab, they can do the CTFs. So, no, the C, and it also helps for, when we think about accommodations, right? I have those students that excel, that are gifted, and they go on and do that stuff, but then that frees me up to give more time to the students that are struggling and you know, that's what stinks about the, the MITRE one is I don't really get to be a part of that as much as I'd really like to be to advise. They kind of have to take it and run with it because that, that gives me time to be in the classroom to work with the students that are struggling with the course material. Time's up? Yep, okay. Thank you all for your time, I appreciate it. Um, please connect with me. Like I said, I've